The Blade Runner movies have a running cyberpunk aesthetic, which conjures up images of Asian countries such as China and Japan. In this video essay, I'll make two points. Point one is that the first Blade Runner movie represents Japan, and the second one represents China. And in point two is that the movies are not entirely bleak or cynical and suggest interesting ways for life to prosper in the Asian century. Although this is not a political video, I will mention key politicians and events. I hope this video will be enjoyed by a wide audience and spoilers will be given for both films. Part 1 The first Blade Runner movie was released when Japan was in an economic boom and was manufacturing many goods. Banks enjoyed more cash, there were greater investments and the yen, the Japanese currency, was competitive. Financial assets were also lucrative, and the general unemployment rate was low. Japan was, and still is, a major technology and finance hub. Not only that, but Japanese pop culture really went into its own in the 80s. Anime and magna became prevalent, with a personal favourite being the animated film Akira, which bears many similarities with Blade Runner. We also saw the start of the information era in Japan with more television and radio stations, and broadcasters having new options to reach their audience. That said, things weren't all pleasant for Japan. Birth rates were declining, giving rise to an ageing population. Internal migration occurred, with many young Japanese citizens opting to move to major cities such as Tokyo and Osaka. Yet Japan, to the American eye, could surpass them as the ultimate global power. How is this shown in Blade Runner? When you watch a movie, you notice that Los Angeles is a very crowded place with unpredictable rain and snow. This ties into the ongoing themes of environmental degradation and urban decay. In Blade Runner's version of LA, information is everywhere from non-stop advertising. LA is an old, grungy, cyberpunk city that's well past its peak and is burdened by new, life-changing technology. However, Los Angeles and Blade Runner does not represent Japan in our world. Tokyo and many Japanese cities constantly rank high for quality of life, cleanliness and order. It's no wonder that Japan enjoys year-long tourism, especially during the cherry blossom or the ski season. Also, whilst Japan has its own interests, it wasn't as hostile to the United States and her allies as China currently is. Yet in all fairness, I say that as a citizen of the 21st century. The first Blade Runner movie was made in a different time with a different attitude, and Japan has a lot to value. So, why is Los Angeles so miserable in Blade Runner? I think it's because the film is critical of Japan being the global superpower, but the reasons aren't what people think. Many people interpret fear of Japan to being yellow peril, and whilst that is true for other works of American cinema, it only scratches the surface of what is going on in Blade Runner. Think of the core plot point in Blade Runner. The wealthy and influential have moved on to other lands, and the rest of the world who can't afford to leave must deal with the decisions by the rich. Japan becoming the dominant superpower does not represent a group effort by the Japanese people, but results from the decisions by the few. That's why Blade Runner is often interpreted as a critique of capitalism. Now, is such a critique warranted or justified? Well, that's up for you to decide. I'm not interested in arguing for a certain economic outlook. What intrigues me is figuring out how Blade Runner interprets nations like Japan and China in a dystopic age. Overall, Blade Runner, like any dystopia, shows us a world where change has gotten out of control. Now, on to China. Decades have passed since the last Blade Runner movie, both in its universe and in our own. In that time, China rose and countries relied on it for manufacturing. China's influence is also political, with accusations of espionage and corruption. Under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, controversial policies such as the social credit score system have slowly been introduced. The current president, Xi Jinping, removed term limits assuring that he'll rule until he dies. China is a totalitarian dictatorship, whereas Japan is not. This is shown in Blade Runner 2049, 
the sequel to the original film. First off, the LA landscape is covered with fog and smoke, or, well, smog. This is reminiscent of Beijing, China's capital, which has damaging and life-changing levels of pollution. Interestingly enough, this article from the Beijing Art even compares its respective city to the dystopic landscape of LA. It's no secret. Beijing's hazardous and its own kind of hell. People die from it every year. This sadly mirrors the short life expectancy of the replicants themselves. China is also known for making people disappear, which demonstrates a police state or at least some form of authoritarianism, which is also similar to making replicants disappear. Another trade of Blade Runner 2049 is how atomized and driven by technology it is to the point it has strained human relationships. For example, Agent K has a robot's lover and is bombarded by constant advertising. The result is humans who are so disconnected from each other and can't form relationships or meaningful bonds. And unfortunately, that is already present in China and will only increase under the social credit system. The result of Blade Runner 2049 and China is a world where human relationships are akin to crawling on broken glass. There is too much risk involved and you'll get hurt and humans naturally want to control their pain. Because of that, it's safer to have an android girlfriend, to accept the advertising, to be a supposedly upstanding citizen. Because to do otherwise is to die, to be stamped on or to disappear into the night. But as Roy Batty says in the ending of the first film, Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. Part 2. The main reason there are Asian aesthetics is because of what they represent. Change. The USA is turning into a direction that is not determined by themselves, but by foreign countries. This signifies change that can't be controlled. And that's scary, as who wants to be powerless in their own fate? Powerless is a huge theme in the Blade Runner movies. The replicants have no say in how their humanity is determined or perceived, or how others look at them. People are clustered into groups and struggle to live content lives. There is also a lot of poverty and crime. Yet both films end on hopeful notes, signifying the rebirth of new life. In the first film, Batty saves Deckard's life which suggests that replicants can overcome their programming. That means they have free will, which is interlined with humanity. Blade Runner 2049 is tricky. K, our protagonist, is mortally wounded, which implies death and loss. However, it was his choice to save Deckard, who then goes on to meet his daughter, who we associate with green scenery, symbolic of renewal and new life. Whilst K probably did die out in the snow, he dies knowing that his actions had meaning and were worth something. Deckard's life is rekindled. That's why the Blade Runner movies aren't outright bleak dystopias. They are not pessimistic. Instead, they encourage us to value our humanity in the age of technology and global change. Here is a quote by Philip K. Dick, the author of Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which Blade Runner is based on. The purpose of the story, as I saw it, was that in his job of hunting and killing these replicants, Deckard becomes progressively dehumanised. Replicants are being perceived as becoming more human. Finally, Deckard must question what he is doing and really what is the essential difference between him and them. And to take it one step further, who is he if there is no real difference? Another strength of the Blade Runner movies is the ambiguity. Answers are not easily given and the films only improve on future viewings. There's an air of uncertainty in this universe, as if we don't know everything that will happen next. And that's true in our own world, especially when we consider the Asian century and what the world will look like. Whether it is positive or negative, I'll let you decide. Thank you for watching and please subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I post videos and blog posts weekly all about fiction. I'm sure you'll find something to enjoy. Thanks again.